Well, hi there once again, as we continue on here at Bible Talk with our In Search of Christianity series. And once again, on behalf of Mark, Alice, and myself, we want to greet you in the wonderful, the precious, <laughs> the name above all names, the only name given by which men can be saved, the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we are continuing. We left off in our last study talking about uniforms. That's uh, looking like a Christian. What, what a Christian should wear. That's This is our third part of that teaching. So we're going to pick that up again now. And I want to talk about, we talk about uniforms, and we talked about the uniforms that you see so often, sports uniforms, police, firemen, uh, sports teams. I say, yeah, yeah. Okay. But the biggest one, and the one I want to talk about now, is the military. Right, right. Okay. Yes. I, I will tell you, one of the first things they do when you join the military is, boom, they hand you a uniform. You know, you, you wear the uniform, the uniform that they tell you. That's you can't say, well, I prefer to have this color instead of that mm -hmm. color. Okay, they give it. But in the same way, we're going to look at uniforms within the body of Christ. Okay? Okay. So I want to talk about soldiers, all right? I just wanted these just a couple of quick verses to put the frame around this. The Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy and said, Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. 2 Timothy 2.3. Mm -hmm. Now when he wrote to the church at Philippi, he said, But I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier. Okay? Mm -hmm. Philippians 2.25. And then to Philemon, he wrote, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved brother and fellow worker, and to Aphia, our sister, and to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. That's an analogy that is used throughout the New Testament, okay? Mm -hmm. But soldiers don't choose, like I just mentioned, they don't choose what they wear. They're told what to wear, exactly. okay? And they're supplied with what to wear. Mm -hmm. I, I know that. I was never a soldier, Fly Navy, baby. <laughs> okay, I'm not going there. But when it comes to the military, you know, there's a great example that I really want us to take a minute to look at. And that's the account, the historical account of David and Goliath. Yes. Now, in 1 Samuel 17, that's where you'll read this account. And it talks about the Philistines. Boy, is there nothing new under the sun? The Philistines were on ground that belonged to Israel. Mm. to the Jews, okay? Yes. And they're, they, they have these two armies. The one army, you know, uh, with their champion, who was Goliath, and the other army, led by their king, Saul, the tallest and brightest that the people wanted. And it's getting bad. This is, warfare is never pretty, okay? It truly is not. And if you think it is, you've, you've, been, you've been lied to, Okay. So let me just read to you from 1 Samuel 17. I'm going to start at verse 4. It says, Then a champion came out from the armies of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was clothed with scale armor, which weighed 5,000 shekels of bronze. He also had bronze greaves on his legs and a bronze javelin slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and the head of his spear weighed 600 shekels of iron. His shield carrier also walked before him. Hmm. Goliath was properly dressed according to the standards of the world for warfare. Battle okay? array. Battle array. Saul and the men of Israel were also dressed for the occasion. Because it says in 17.2, 1 Samuel 17.2, and Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and camped in the valley of Allah and drew up in battle array to encounter the Philistines. Mm -hmm. So both armies are dressed for warfare, yes. right? Yes. And they're at this, this valley of Allah, Oak Valley, and the Philistines on one side of the valley and the Israelites on the other side of the valley. They were all playing the part, okay? So now the account of this, because this is going on day after day after day, the account of this reaches back to Bethlehem, where David is, and David is watching over his father's sheep, his flock, right? Mm -hmm. And it says in 1 Samuel 17, 20, so David arose early in the morning and left the flock with the keeper and took the supplies and went as Jesse, that's his father, right, had commanded him. 
And he came to the circle of the camp while the army was going out in battle array, shouting the war cry. Mm -hmm. So you, here you have the, the, the army of Israel. They're all dressed in their battle clothing. And they're going out and they're shouting a war cry. Mm -hmm. Which might have fooled other believers who were judging by outward appearance. Mm -hmm. Like David's own father. Like David's own father. Mm -hmm. David's father told David, for Saul and they and all the men of Israel are in the valley of Allah fighting with the Philistines. 1 Samuel 17, 19. They were fighting. They're fighting like little children on a school ground going, nah, 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 nah. <laughs> fighting with the Philistines. Yeah. They weren't fighting at all, no, right? They weren't. That's what happens when you're playing Christianity, okay? So when David was about to face Goliath on the field of battle, and because it says in verse 26, then David spoke to the men who were standing by him saying, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should taunt the armies of the living God? Some people will tell you that David did this looking for the reward. David did this because he couldn't stand to see the reproach of Israel. And because the armies of the living God were being taunted. Well, one of the interesting things is Saul was chosen because he was tall, the tallest guy, the biggest guy, mm -hmm. and he was to go out and fight this battle if you, if, or this type of battle. If you go by outward appearance, you would believe that. But yes. even Goliath was, I mean, Saul was puny compared to Goliath. But you're right. They, this was a time, it was not uncommon, for armies to come together and they would have champions, champions go out onto the battlefield and do the, the battle, army. rather than the entire armies, okay? Mm -hmm. So, but here's the point now, all right? The ones who are walking, not walking in faith, mm -hmm. Christians who are not walking in faith, will be challenged by those who are. Yes. Okay? And then they will either be encouraged by their faith mm -hmm. or offended by their, by their faith. Right. If they do not repent and turn from their lack of faith, they will try to get those who are to be like them. Does that make sense? Did you get that? I'm saying that if, if you if, if I'm walking in faith and other I go to other Christians and they're not walking in faith, my faith will either be an encouragement to them well, or offend. it'll offend them. And then you'll try to get others to be like you instead of no, like the other guy. No, they'll try and get me to be like them. Exactly. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. If, if they are not walking in faith, they're they, offended by you. Right. They will try and get others to behave like themselves because right. it takes the burden of guilt off them. They say, well, everybody's doing it. Okay. Right. So it says in verse 38, then Saul clothed David with his garments and put a bronze helmet on his head and he clothed him with armor. Mm -hmm. There is Saul trying to get David to look just like him. Right. And, that's, and he was the wrong size. Okay. Well, that uh, well, that's, no, that wasn't the. I'm, I'm telling you spiritually, that's not the re, that's not yeah. the issue. Okay. It, yeah, but it didn't fit. It didn't fit because it wouldn't fit spiritually. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's the point, right? So he he has this armor on now from Saul, but he wasn't properly dressed mm -hmm. because the protection doesn't come from worldly armor. That's not where protection comes. So David said to Saul, "I cannot go with these." For I have not tested them. And David took them off. Verse 39, right? Mm -hmm. He's not gonna, he's not gonna go out on the battlefield. All these other soldiers are there, they're all dressed in battle array. But what are they doing? Nothing, right? So now David was properly dressed. And and once out on the field of battle, and remember, he was there to fight the Philistine. Or was he? He's there to represent God. Uh -huh. Perhaps he was doing battle with the God of the Philistines. Mm. Can, you, can you see this? Think about this. Remember that Goliath was trusting in his gods. Yes. You can say, well, he trusted in his size. If he, well, of course, he, to some degree, he's a, he's a pagan. He's trusting in his size, his armor. But then why did he say this? It says in verse 42 and 43, when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him. For he was but a youth and ruddy, 
with a handsome appearance. And the Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. He put a curse on him by his gods. Mm -hmm. That should do the trick. And here he is. Here's this mammoth guy, and he's looking at David. David didn't come out wearing armor. No. He came out wearing armor. Saul may have said, I mean, Goliath well, he, was, he was almost, I would say, insulted. He was insulted. Because you, you send this out to me? Yeah, that's, that's exactly. He was, in he was insulted. Yeah. Because here comes this young man. That's what it says, right? Yeah. He was a youth and ruddy with a handsome appearance. Mm -hmm. He comes out. He's not wearing armor. No. He's not dressed in the battle array. Not dressed in the worldly battle exactly. array, right? Yeah. So I'm saying that Goliath was trusting in his, his own size, but he was trusting in his gods. And David, on the other hand, was trusting in his God. Yes. Because it says in verse 45, Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. And Goliath knew then he was in yeah. for a fight. Is that right? Yes. Because yeah. it, 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 think about this in verse 48. This is really important. In verse 48, you got to get this picture. Well, verse 46 says it even more. <laughs> so it doesn't say more than what I'm going to say. Uh, okay. Okay. My, my point is that Goliath had no concern whatsoever until David said that. I come to you in the name of the Lord. And it says, in, then it says in verse 48, then it happened when the Philistine rose and came and drew near. The Philistine rose. He hadn't even been standing up. He's sitting in the grass having himself a time. He has no concern whatsoever. Right? If it says he rose, that means he was sitting down. Sitting or laying down, yeah. Yeah, and because here he's looking at David. What's this David? A young man. He's ruddy. He's handsome. He's not, a, not in, even in armor. But when David said to him, I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, Goliath got up because he knew he was in for a fight. It wasn't about what David was wearing. It was what was David was wearing in his heart. Mm -hmm. The confidence of God, right? So like David, a man after God's own heart, we have to be properly attired and properly armed for the battle. Right? Yes. <clears throat> it says in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3 and 4, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. Mm -hmm. We don't war according to the flesh, all right? So that brings us to the whole armor of God. Mm -hmm. This is the way we are supposed to be dressed. It says in Ephesians 6, and you might want to turn to this. We're going to spend some time in Ephesians. Ephesians 6, starting in verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Isn't that what I was saying about David yes. when he went out? Was he fighting Goliath or was he fi fighting Goliath's gods? Our warfare is not against flesh and blood. It's not about those people. And our weapons of our warfare are not, uh, they are not of the flesh. They're divinely powerful. So before the first taunt is shouted, before, before the first stone or arrow flies, you better remember this from, from the prophet Zechariah. Then he answered and said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel saying, not by power nor by might, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts, Zechariah 4, 6. If the battle is the Lord's, the victory is the Lord's. We just need to cheer him on. Amen. That's what it says in Isaiah 42 from verse 10 to verse 13. If you're not familiar with that, go read it. You need to read it. Okay. 
I want to make I, I do want to make note of a really important translation note here in in those verses I just read. Though, okay, in Ephesians. In Ephesians, yes, where it talks about so we'll be able to stand fast against the schemes of the devil. Mm -hmm. All right. In verse eleven, that that Greek word is translated uh, as schemes. By the way, what it most literally says in the Greek is methods. Uh, okay. No methods, right? Methods. The methods of the devil. Okay. The King James translates that as wiles, yeah. which is about his methods, right? Mm -hmm. So is it the schemes of the devil or the wiles of the devil? You know, is one translation right, one wrong? No, no. the fact is they're, they're both correct, but there's a, there is a significant difference. And by the way, here in the United States of America, the word schemes has a negative connotation. Mm -hmm. A scheme is something bad, has bad intent, all right? But in England and Europe and, uh, for example, schemes, they don't have any, it's, it's just a plan. Just a plan. They're, they're, yeah, they're just a, it can be good, it can be bad, but it's just a plan, right? A wiles, the wiles. Mm. Um, the word wiles is defined as a strategy meant, I'm reading this from the dictionary, mm -hmm. to fool, trap, or entice. Yes. Right. Yeah. Okay. And most often... It has a sense of seduction. Mm. Okay. Okay. Sense, yeah. Okay. The wiles of that mm. woman, right? In in the Strong's, it says lying in wait. What? So it says one of the definitions. It of says what? lie in wait of what? as as in trying to trap an animal or kill an animal. You lie in wait for the animal to come by. Okay. Yeah, but. The, the word, trust me on this, it's wiles, it's methods, that's the literal, but it's, the, the reason the wiles is the correct, correct, correct translation, it because it is about seduction, okay? Mm -hmm. the, it, the reason for that is that it has to be the tool of the devil, because he's been disarmed and right. defeated, right. okay? He it's can't, he can't wait. Uh, and, and trap you and jump on you and bonk you on the head yeah. and take what's He's yours. He comes as a thief. That's what Jesus said. Mm -hmm. But he comes as a particular kind of thief. And that kind of thief is a con man. Now, con men have robbed so much more money than muggers ever have. I mean, I, this is going back a few years now. I think one of the greatest robberies ever per perpetrated was by this guy, Bernie Madoff. Yeah. And no, he never put a gun to anybody's head. He never bonked anybody over the head and, and stole their wallet out of their pocket. Everybody that was robbed by Bernie Madoff voluntarily handed the money over to him. Yes. He talked them into it. Right. And that's the tool of the devil. That's the wiles. It's seductive. Mm -hmm. All right. He gets you to do it. All right. He can't, he can't bonk you. He can only attempt to beguile you. You know, right? That's a, that's a good word for it. Mm -hmm. He has to talk you into giving him what is yours. Think about the, the temptations of Jesus in the wilderness. Yeah. You didn't Why didn't... Now, I want you to remember something. You can... A lot of people just miss this point. When Jesus was being tempted in the wilderness, people say, well, he, he withstood the devil because he's Jesus. Well, the fact of the matter is that was Jesus... Empty of power. That's right. Because it wasn't until he came out that he came out in the in power of the Holy Spirit. Spirit. He went into the wilderness devoid of power because he had emptied himself, as it says in Philippians yes. chapter 2. Yes. So he was relying on, he had nothing to rely on in the wilderness. Yes. He had no power of his own. He didn't have the power of the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. to deal with the devil. What did he have? He had the word of God. And over and over, what he said to the devil was, it is written. That was what he had for that battle, okay? The word. But in each case, the devil, the devil said, well, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down. Mm. Why didn't he just get up and push him? Mm. <laughs> because if he tried, he'd still be there pushing. No power. Okay, because the devil has no power, all right? So that's the situation we're in. The devil will try and talk you into surrendering what is truly yours in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. Don't give it up. And use the same tools that Jesus did. Mm -hmm. But now you even can do that in the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. It is written. We'll get, we'll get to that. Now, what's the only weapon that God has given us when you look at the, the whole armor of God? 
It's the sword, the word of God, okay? All right, so let's look at that now. It says in Ephesians 6, starting at verse 13, it says, Therefore, take up the full armor of God, that you may be able to resist in the evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, in addition to all, taking up the shield of faith, with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming missiles of the evil, evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So, what are, what are the things here? Gird your loins with truth, put on the breastplate of righteousness, shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, take up the shield of faith, take the helmet of salvation, take the sword of the Spirit. That's the way Christians are supposed to be dressed. That's the attire of the well-dressed Christian. Amen. Can I say something here? Uh, for a second. Um, in verses 14, 15, and 16, in the message thing, not the Bible, but the message thing, uh, in, like, for instance, in verse 14, the King James says, Stand therefore, having your loins girded about with truth, having on the breastplate, breastplate of righteousness. That was one verse. Do you know the equivalent verse in the message? Truth, righteousness. Okay. Wait. There's no expansion upon that. Usually the message Bible is wordy. It's got more words than all the other let, let me just say, I, I, I different really, versions. Yeah, we don't that want one answer. just cut out I, everything. I know the message. But we're, we it, don't want to even bring okay. in the message. Well, Bible. let me let me <laughs> make this Bible. clear. If you've not joined us before, I will tell you that we are not fans of the message thing. That's right. And that and that is putting it mildly. Absolutely, the sword of the word it says. It says in, in Hebrews that the word of God, that word, is sharper than any two-edged sword. All right. The message thing is like a dull pocket knife. And if you want to go into battle with a dull pocket knife, because it is not does not have that sharpness of the word. I, I am telling you that if you're using the message thing as your principal study, study Bible, please trouble. do yourself a favor. Do yourself a favor. Ask the Lord to show you if that's what he would have you use. Mm -hmm. And I know all of the reasons that people tell me they use it, mm -hmm. but I'm asking you, to have a conversation with Jesus right. and see what he has to say to you, okay? All right. So, okay? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not a fan of the Message Bible, okay? It's not a Bible. It's not even a Bible. <laughs> All right, so the first thing is that he said was gird your loins, yes. right? Mm -hmm. Now, the focus of, st of the statement is not the gird part. The focus of the statement is the loins. Yes, Okay, the gird, that's that's kind of denotes a belt that would hold up the loin covering, right? But this pronouncement is about keeping your loins covered. Now, you know what loins are. I, I assume that you know what loins are. For those of us who not. The loins is your... Stomach? No, no, no. The loins are your genital area. Oh. Okay? Reproductive parts. Reproductive parts. And that's the key to this, okay? Yes. That your loins are your reproductive parts, Okay. Um, the first thing that Adam and the woman did when they sinned in the garden was to cover their loins. That's right. Okay. Genesis 3, 7. All right. If it were about the belt and a lot of, I mean, a lot of Bible scholars tell you it's about the belt they were wearing. Well, it's not about the belt at all. That's like me. You know, you can say what's important is I've got pants, I've got slacks on and a belt. If I take my belt off, maybe the pants will, but that's what's important is the pants. That's right. Cover. <laughs> okay. The covering. the covering, all right? Okay, in the second chapter of Acts, Peter, who is speaking of David to the multitudes on, multitudes on the day of Pentecost, related the fact that King David, and this I'm reading now from Acts 2.30, it says, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Messiah to sit on his throne. Mm. Jesus, the Messiah, came from the loins of David. Oh, it's the place of the seed of life, all right? Mm -hmm. In the letter to the Hebrews, the writer speaking of ties in the priesthood and talking about Abraham, 
when he was, you know, tied to Melchizedek, mentions that Levi, which is generations removed, generations yet to come, it said, was yet in the loins of his father, Hebrews 7.10. So the loins are the place of the reproductive power, the seed of life. This protecting or covering that we're talking about now here in the full armor of God is simply because the devil is deathly afraid of Christians, us bond servants, reproducing. Yes. Okay. Huh. The loins, centers of reproductive power, is the target of Satan's seductive wiles and his schemes. Mm. Not the heart, not the brain, but the loins. Mm. And all too many people, particularly in this day and age, when sexual permissiveness is a cesspool flooding our society, people are being led about by their loins. One of the interesting things is to grow, you need the truth. Because it oh, says yeah. your yeah, loins are I, I, I didn't get to the truth. Oh, no, no, that's all right. But it's just, I, but it's, I, I, you need, you, in order for this to, you kind of get the fact that. that the loins, what that's talking about, is this, this is where the seed of life is. Yes. And Satan hates the idea that we can bring new life into the kingdom of God. Mm-hmm. We can be used to do that, right? Yes. By proclaiming the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness. So, but, but think about this. I mean, we are living in a, you know, I, I think I said it properly, a cesspool. Mm-hmm. It's a cesspool. And, and the immorality in our society today is absolutely rampant. And that is an incredible understatement. Mm-hmm. Okay. And yet it says in the book of Revelation, in the ninth chapter, the end of the ninth chapter, it talks about these end days when men will not repent of their immorality. So now spiritually appraise this, okay? From 1 Timothy 2.9, spiritually appraise this. Likewise, I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, modestly and discreetly, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly garments. So what's that got to do with me? All right? Because the men are supposed to dress like men. The men are supposed to act like men, right? Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. But you better remember, guys, gents, that we are the bride of Christ. That's right. We are the bride of Christ. We need to be dressed morally. All right? That is the truth mm. that we need to gird our loins with. It is about that modesty yeah, because yeah. We, are, we are the bride of Christ. Beware of committing spiritual adultery against Jesus, our bridegroom, who is soon to come and giving the devil opportunity. That's why we need to gird our loins. Women have loins too, you know. We need to be careful about our moral behavior. Mm. That's different than righteousness, Yes. but it's important. We may talk about that in our next session, (laughs) but the time goes by so quickly. Father, we just thank you for the time that you give us, Lord God. We thank you for the time that is coming when we will see you face to face and be exactly as you are, Lord God. Lord, help us to walk in the fullness of your word. Help us to truly be clothed in this whole armor that you've given us, this whole armor of God, Lord, that we might resist the wiles of the evil one. Well, until next time, God bless you and goodbye. Yeah.